Great. Good afternoon. Uh, today is Thursday, March 19th, um, and this is our second uh, video community update on the COVID-19 situation. The first one we did was on March 9th, so almost 10 days ago. Um, that first one was live streamed. This one will not be. We're going to record it and get it up on the county website as soon as we can after this. Uh, the first time we did this, we had some bandwidth issues and a number of people trying to watch live weren't able to. Uh, apologies to those folks. So um, thanks for your patience as we work through this. Um, I'm here with Ellen Wilcox once again from County Health and Community Services. Ellen, just tell us about your role uh, in everyday life and, and here today. Well, in everyday life, I'm the Healthy Communities Manager with San Juan County Health and Community Services. I'm a public health practitioner. I've been working in public health for the last 20 years and with San Juan County for five. Great. And I'm Brendan Cowan. I'm the Emergency Management Director for the county and the town of Friday Harbor. I've been doing this for about 17 years. Um, as with our first meeting, we've got a lot of questions from folks from across the islands, a lot of what I think are pretty good questions. Uh, we had a team of people sort through them, try to group them into categories, and, and put them into a format that we can, we can work with. Um, as before, a lot of what we're knowing and, and learning about COVID changes. Um, it changes rapidly, almost daily. Um, I think that only adds to the stress for the people who are working on the response and then the general public. Um, so I think for us, these videos, even though they're sort of one-way communication originally, are, uh, are a way for us to check in with the community and the islands. Um, and as before, we'd love to hear back from people on the HCS Facebook page if you have any feedback. Yeah, so here we are well, once again. And Brendan, you were uh, you were talking about this being a stressful time. I'm just checking in on you. How's your stress level? <laughs> uh, I would say that hopefully people will be a little patient with us um, if we're a little more tired and less fluent than we were the first time. Uh, we've been super busy. I know that what we've been doing probably pales in comparison to a lot of folks on the healthcare front. Uh, I will look at what our supermarkets and our you know our pharmacies and all those mm -hmm. folks are doing, what our businesses are going through. Um, school teachers and all the work the school districts have done. Um, it's a rough go for all of us. Uh, shout out to my uh, therapist who I haven't seen in a few years, but who texted me over the couple days ago and said, hey, what do you need? Um, so we'll be Skyping this weekend because it's been, it's been tough. Um, and I, I know you've been dealing with that too. Absolutely. There are a lot of uh, wonderful people uh, working around the clock on this, not only on the public health and healthcare side, but as you mentioned, schools, businesses, um, trying to make this time of uncertainty and stress and worry as um, calming as possible possible. That's part of what we are trying to do. Uh, and, and part of that is through these updates is just making sure we're getting good information out there and reminding people that there actually is a lot that we can do, even though it feels maybe out of control at times. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, let's get into the questions. Um, kind of group categories. The first category we're looking at is testing. Mm -hmm. um, were there lots of questions? I know even we have questions about this. Uh, someone from Lopez uh, wrote in on our online forum and asked about um, they're confused about testing in San Juan County and want to know why they can't get a test. Yeah. Testing is, is still a huge challenge in Washington State, certainly San Juan County, um, but also in the U.S. and around the world. So we are not alone in this challenge. Um, lab capacity has increased, and that's great. In the last couple of weeks, we've been greatly able to expand the number of labs who can offer these tests. Uh, however, the challenge we are facing right now is, is really around supplies. That's statewide, that's nationwide, uh, and certainly locally, and that's the testing supplies needed for COVID. So the swabs where we collect specimens from people's noses or throats so that we can test for that virus are in short supply. So due to that shortage of supplies, healthcare providers are being still asked to prioritize testing for a subgroup of individuals. So that includes patients who are hospitalized or experiencing severe symptoms like respiratory, uh, lower respiratory illness, uh, healthcare workers. First responders, law enforcement, EMS, firefighters, uh, and also patients who have been exposed in a facility, for instance, in a healthcare facility, in a hospital, nursing homes, uh, or other congregate settings. And the reasons for that are, again, we're, we're dealing with a supply issue and we need to put some prioritization on populations who are at greatest risk. And uh, the frontline workers, for instance, EMS or healthcare workers, uh, are at higher risk of being exposed to the virus, and they're also at higher risk for spreading the virus inadvertently uh, because they're interfacing with vulnerable populations who are more susceptible to uh, getting COVID. So we want to catch those people early if they have been exposed, if they have the virus, and pull them away from the work uh, that mm -hmm. we're counting on them to do. And sure. that's really to protect themselves 
their coworkers, and their our community at large. Um, we do hope that testing is be- going to become uh, more available and more accessible. I know those promises have been made at the federal level, uh, but the supply pieces need to catch up, and we really do hope it can change. I know a lot of people are clamoring uh, to get tested, uh, and we do need strong leadership at the federal level uh, to work on the production and supply chain issues. So it's not a lack of willingness or want. Uh, it's a matter of needing to be really careful with our resources and prioritize accordingly. Okay, that's great. And I think those those guidelines, for who gets tested and how those decisions are made, mm-hmm. those are really coming from very high up to all of the health care providers in the county. Yep. That's not a county decision at any level. You're right. That's okay. set by the CDC and the Department of Health here in Washington State based on how this virus is spreading uh, and how, the, how available those resources are for testing. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the next question, I think this came from Orcus, and it's similar. Um, it's, I'm a senior citizen. I'm told I'm in the population that is most at risk in this situation. When and how will I get tested? That's a great question. First of all, uh, the most important thing is to minimize your social contact as much as possible. Uh, even if you do test positive, there's no medicine to directly treat the virus. Um, so if you don't have symptoms, Please just stay home. Uh, Reaching out to others in your community to help you with delivery of food or other essential goods can help minimize your risk. If you don't have anyone to help with those deliveries, um, uh, county senior services offices and family resource centers are a good uh, uh, on each island are good places to reach out uh, and ask for help, and they'll put you uh, in touch with those who could help uh, when at all possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have contact information for those organizations up on our county COVID Facebook uh, website or. Sorry, Facebook page and, and our website. Um, for for those who do have symptoms, we ask that you please reach out to your health care provider. Um, they are going to work with you to decide whether you should be getting tested mm-hmm. or whether to stay home. And they're the ones who, should, who will be guiding you through that process. Okay, that's great. I'm going to circle back just because I think it's really important, and I know an enormous amount of work has been going on in the community to get this functional. But on that county health and community services Facebook page or contact info, for the Family Resource Centers on San Juan and Lopez, Mm -hmm. the Community Resource Center on Orcas, and then the Senior Services offices on each of those islands. And they are receiving phone calls today from people who are not able to leave their house because they're in a high-risk population um, who might need help with something, um, with getting food or supplies or, or other services. I think I would just clarify that if you have a family member or a neighbor or someone in your neighborhood group in your, who can help you with this, that's our first choice, mm-hmm. right? Um, neighbors helping neighbors, it's, that's really what we're after. Uh, but for people who have no other options for whatever reason, no matter what it is, uh, these are resources that are out there. And so when I saw that news come out, I'm really excited about that going I forward. I am too. And, and just very grateful for those resources and, um, and will in our community. Uh, next question, um, how long is it currently taking to get test results? So commercial labs have started processing tests, which should help speed results, uh, and it is helping. Uh, Results are typically taking between three to five days to process, so there is a delay. There's a period for those who are getting tested. They have symptoms, they're in a high-risk group, and they're having to wait three to five days for those test results, which can be frustrating and probably scary. Um, Designated labs are on the mainland. We don't have any local labs here who process those uh, tests, Uh, and so the commercial labs are processing them as quickly as possible, and we do hope and expect that to increase. Um, And as that keeps changing, we'll certainly let islanders know that that is changing, and we'll keep you posted. Okay, that's great. I think last we looked at the numbers, we had 40 total tests given in the county so far to date. If I remember correctly, 27 of those are negative, 13 are still pending. For those people who are pending, What's our advice to them while they're waiting for their test results? Do they stay at home? Advice to them is to stay at home. It's very possible that any one of these tests could show up as a positive test. It hasn't happened yet, but we know it could happen at any moment. Uh, So the advice is if you've risen to the level of symptoms and risk where you have a provider who's ordered testing for you, you should be staying at home. Providers are messaging that really well to their patients. Public health is also messaging that and following up with those patients to make sure they have the supports they need, and they also understand what they're being asked to do until they're cleared from that risk or the risk is identified. Okay. 
That's great. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question, and, and we and I have been getting a lot of questions and emails and calls about this, and I totally understand why. Um, the question is, why can't we get live time reporting on the statistics around testing and impacts? And um, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about this and working this through, but take a crack at it. Sure, sure. Well, there's a statewide tool for tracking this data, but it takes a while for those results to get entered by various labs and providers. Uh, We also have a community that travels um, for medical services, too. So sometimes just figuring out which uh, county a person resides in and then that gets assigned to that county can take a little bit of sorting. We do excellent work with our um, neighboring counties who uh, often see patients from San Juan County. Um, So there can be a little bit of a lag time. So one of the beauties of living in a setting as small as we are living Living in is we have a small group of medical providers, and so our public health staff is actually manually gathering that da- data daily uh, with providers, not waiting for the systems to sort that out uh, more centrally. Uh, and so we're posting that data on our county website uh, Monday through Friday uh, in the evening. And that's a snapshot in time as we receive those daily updates. Uh, people, I, We'd like people to know also that specimens don't get shipped off for testing over the weekend. Uh, generally, there can be few exceptions to that. And so the most meaningful data is going to be Monday through Friday when we're getting those test results back. Um, and the challenges being faced by hospitals and providers uh, everywhere means that getting that information out quickly is difficult, but... Um, there are a lot of systems at play, mm-hmm. and we want to make sure that we're giving accurate, consistent information rather than inaccurate information as we're sorting through where a patient might reside. Yeah, I know I, this is really important, and this is we've tried to put some language on the mm-hmm. website where the numbers are being reported to highlight this, that you know, I think what we're trying to achieve is to be as accurate as possible, not necessarily as timely as possible. I think that it's it's entirely likely that at some point in time there's going to be news or information that is in the community and people are aware of, and it's before it makes it up to that web page. Um, obviously, if it's a positive test result, we're going to be trying to chase it down and confirm and make sure we understand the big picture. Um, but that accuracy is really first and foremost. We want to get this right. Um, uh, so sort of shifting away from testing a little bit, moving into treatment, um, which is our next our next category. Um, Another, I feel like all these areas are areas we've been spending an enormous amount of time working on. Um, do the local EMS agencies, clinics, and hospitals have adequate supplies? We've all been reading about this in the papers, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Sure. Well, like everywhere, we are grappling with issues uh, for some supplies, not all, um, mostly around personal protective equipment. And this is the equipment that our healthcare providers and EMS and our first responders rely on and need to keep themselves safe during this time. Uh, the county is releasing some older stock piled masks to uh, the emergency uh, EMS agencies and providers. Um, But this shortage is a big problem, not only locally, but nationally and globally. There are big shortages. Um, And so we are, again, having to be really uh, mindful of our resources. What can we reuse safely? And what do we need to wait on? Because we can't do this in a safe way. And we want to keep our first responders and medical providers protected at all times. Um, They currently have protective equipment equipment and supplies, uh, but they're also actively taking measures to order more, as many as they can uh, and to conserve what is on hand. And that's the sad reality of, of what they are facing uh, every day. And we're not alone in that. So it's not just San Juan County being overlooked here. This is happening statewide, nationally, and globally. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I mean, I've been reaching out through just my friends and contacts in the emergency management world, just Snohomish County, King County, they, they're getting nothing. Um, there's nothing out there. Um, it's just trickling in in a few spots every once in a while. Um, so that's clearly a big challenge. Um, I think part of our challenge here in this messaging is we, we're not all doom and gloom, right? I mean, there are lots of good things that are happening, good work that's happening. Um, but we've got to be real with folks about where the challenges are and I don't think there's anyone who could tell you that this isn't a major challenge. Um, And kind of like with the testing supplies, uh, really the only solution that we see in the short term or longer term is some sort of real ramping up of production capacity at a national level. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm being told that there are task forces in the federal government that are working exclusively on this and are, you know, working with large manufacturers to try to get this going. Um, But clearly we haven't seen any results of that yet. That's absolutely right. 
Um, this next question, I think, is from San Juan, um, and they're wondering, why are our medical providers turning people away? Mm. Well, healthcare providers across the country and also in San Juan County are doing everything they can to make sure their facilities remain uh, a safe place for people to access, uh, not only people who are symptomatic with COVID, uh, but who have other medical needs that, re- that, that require coming to a healthcare facility. So our healthcare providers have a really tough balancing act right now of uh, preventing the spread of disease and also treating islanders uh, with their emergency or urgent medical needs. Um, routine medical visits are being postponed so that providers' appointments and resources can be saved for the response to COVID and also more acute medical needs uh, and, and to do so safely so that patients can access their facilities in a very safe way. And it might be very frustrating for people to hear that they can't come into their provider provider uh, with, with whom they have a very good right. relationship. They might want that reassurance. They might feel that face-to-face contact is really important. Um, but these are unusual times, and I think we need to all recognize that the providers are making very difficult choices, and they are doing the best they can with the resources they have and the best they can to protect their patients and the public. And so those are the reasons behind those decisions. Uh, many of our providers are setting up telehealth services. Right. If they hadn't had them already, they're setting them up now. We really strongly encourage the public, if your provider has uh, access to telehealth and can see you remotely from your living room or your kitchen, um, and you can have a virtual face-to-face through telehealth, sign up for that service and and help them out and help yourself out so that you can not have to be in a position where you're having to go into a clinic to be assessed. Um, Our provider community is is very much taking care of the needs of their patients. Um, But again, if something can be easily or safely rescheduled, there's a chance that that might happen. And that, again, these are extraordinary times, and this is what it's calling for. And it's calling for some community understanding and support around that. Uh, Our providers are working very, very hard. This also might mean patients who have milder symptoms of COVID are asked to stay home, which might seem confusing. Uh, But again, 80% of people who have COVID um, are able to stay at home safely and recuperate there rather than accessing the medical system and potentially exposing others in a clinic setting. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And that's good information. And I really think just having that empathy and understanding for what the healthcare providers are going through is really, I mean, that's a big part of this. Um, Here's a complicated question, um, but let's take a crack at it. Uh, Has an island location been identified for isolating or caring for folks who become infected? And would, would those patients or would those patients be taken off island? Sure. So the, again, the majority of people with this illness have mild or moderate symptoms, sometimes no symptoms at all. Uh, they can take care of themselves at home, and that is the goal, is to keep people at home. It's the safest place for them to be. Um, if you have symptoms that are concerning to you, including a fever, a cough, or shortness of breath, um, then we ask that you call your medical provider, and they will help you make the decision about whether to stay at home or whether to come into their clinic. And from there, uh, there's no currently... There's currently no need um, to create isolation centers or quarantine centers based on what we're seeing here in the island. And a lot of people probably are going to prefer to stay at home anyway. Um, Isolating at home is best. But if that does change, we actually have quite a lot of planning efforts underway uh, where we have identified potential facilities for that. So if that need does develop, then we will respond to that need. And that's that's a lot of, there's a lot of um, kind of, behind-the-scenes work that's happening to plan for those scenarios, but we're not there yet. So Mm -hmm. it's a great question. Um, For those who need advanced medical care, the top option is going to be to transport to the mainland. And that is our usual landscape, COVID or not, right. uh, when people get to a certain threshold, and that's by design in our community, then people are transported to the mainland. And so we have a lot of efforts underway with the mainland hospitals uh, to increase capacity as we will con- and will continue to use that option for as long as possible. We have good relationships built with many of those mainland facilities. So as long as the bed capacity is there, uh, we will continue to transport uh, appropriately in the event that off-island transport is just not possible, and that could happen, um, the worst-case planning uh, is happening at the county level uh, as part of our emergency response, and that is to um, make sure that we have uh, adequate facilities for people to, to 
kind of shelter in place Uh um, while they're waiting to be transported off. Um, Peace Island Medical Center is proactively making plans for how they're going to be expanding their uh, capacity on San Juan, and we're also uh, actively working on plans for Orcas and Lopez, should we get to that point. Uh We hope we don't get there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very much, it's like so much of this, it's planned for the worst and and hope for the best. Absolutely. And those plans are are complicated enough uh, Mm -hmm. logistically that we need to start really moving forward long before the need arises, because if we wait until then, we're, we've waited too long, probably. So. Yeah, and you know, I think our, our philosophy is we'd, we'd, we'd rather be criticized for planning too much rather than not planning far enough, uh, far enough ahead. I look forward to the day where you and I are sitting in this room talking to the county council explaining why we made all this effort when in the end we didn't need it. <laughs> um, that would, be a, that would, would be a good day. Sure. Um, next question. Uh, if I've been sick with COVID-like symptoms, how long do I have to isolate after my symptoms go away? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Very good question. So the current guidance is um, isolate uh, until through three days after all symptoms go away or seven days after your first symptom, whichever is longer. And and if you're in a p- uh, point where you have been isolated, it means you've contacted your health care provider, you've had public health staff reach out to you, and so we'll provide that guidance to you so it's really clearly understood. Uh, but remember, we should all be isolating ourselves as much as possible, no matter what. This is one of the biggest things that we can do and we can control during this time. Um, new data out of the CDC highlights that uh, this disease affects a wide Range, range of ages, uh, and in fact, about 40% of hospitalizations to date have been in people from the 20 to 59-year-old age uh, range. So that's a little bit different than what our common perception is, that it's mm-hmm. all the elderly who are being hospitalized. That's not exactly the full story. Uh, they are most at risk for developing severe symptoms um, and not doing as well, uh, but there are a lot of people who are hospitalized even in a younger age range. Um, social distancing is the one thing that we can control and the one thing that will get us through this faster and more successfully. And we will get to the other side of this, um, and our hope is to do it as quickly as possible and uh, with that curve staying as flat as possible. And that curve is something that's out there most people are probably aware of by now. So seriously, uh, we're, we're really asking, don't get your kids together with friends. Don't socialize in person. Uh, minimize contact as much as you possibly can. It's hard when people, we are social beings and we crave that, uh, that social connection, but uh-huh. we need to be looking at other ways to do that. A phone call, FaceTime. Um, and I think everyone now understands what a big deal this is. And uh, But for anyone out there who doesn't, we, we ask that you understand that this is indeed very serious. Uh, and we need to take these extreme, seemingly extreme measures mm-hmm. to protect ourselves. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I know we get accused of saying the same thing over and over again, mm-hmm. but that's because the basics of this are just so, it's so important. Um, it's such a big deal. Um, our next category that we're going to talk about is sort of, I guess we're calling it like home life, uh, prevention, maybe a little bit more about mm-hmm. social distancing. Um, there's sort of a bigger bucket here. Um, this one, I don't think either of you are, are either you or I are experts on this, but we've certainly learned a lot and had a lot of conversations uh, recently and talked to a lot of people who really are experts. Um, So the question is, I think this came from San Juan, what home cleaning is most effective? Can I wash clothes with cold water or must it be hot? And what household cleaners are most effective? And I'll kind of start this off by saying that there are a lot of good resources out there, including some on the county website and other places, but kind of what's your take on this? Sure. Well, I'll try to break down the specific questions that you asked. So warm water uh, washing of clothes uh, seems to work better than cold water, but uh, any washing is still better than not washing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bleach is highly effective against the virus, and the CDC also recommends alcohol-based solutions 70% or more as an effective cleaning tool. Uh, For hand sanitizer, 60% is probably effective and certainly better than nothing at all. Uh, But look for something between 60 and 95%. Remember, this is not a bacteria. This is a virus. So antibacterial soaps are no more effective than regular soaps. And you're right, Brendan. The CDC has a, a full list of effective cleaning tools. Um, that information can be found on the CDC website, and it can also be accessed locally through our own county website. It'll link you out to that CDC guidance. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, I, I don't know about you, but my hands are getting kind of chapped and raw uh, from, from doing so much hand washing. Um, and so making sure 
sure we're caring for our hands. So open sores are, are from frequent cleaning of your hands can allow viruses to readily uh, spread. Uh, and so hand sanitizers uh, can be also very drying mm-hmm. and frequent use of those. I'm experiencing that. Um, it can be challenging. You can put some hand lotion on after you clean and sanitize. Yeah. Um, but also kind of a, a caveat with uh, homemade solutions, which people are making, uh, they can also be too harsh on the hands if you don't do it right. Mm-hmm. And so that can also increase your risk for those open sores and just dryness. It's yeah, not comfortable. No, that makes sense. You know, it's funny. I mean, we have, we're looking for... For victories, right? I think mm-hmm. we're all in a place where some forward progress would be welcome at mm-hmm. this point. Um, I've received a number of calls and a few emails from people with that hand drying out issue. Mm-hmm. And I think over the course of this, we've shifted from please, please wash your hands to how do we help you manage the fact that you're washing your hands so much? It's a public yeah. health victory, right? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a start. <laughs> um, the next question, I think of the team that helped put these questions together through this in uh, to keep us on our toes and, and maybe give us a smile in the middle of this. But the question is, what do I do if I can't find toilet paper, right? <laughs> I mean, and this is, this is a, in a nutshell, the summary of lots of questions about lots of different things. Um, but it's kind of a good segue for us just to talk about supply chain issues and, sure. and products. And, you know, there's a lot of concern out there. And I don't know, maybe you take a crack at it and then I'll chime in sure, on this sure. one. Sure, no, sure. The supply issues are a big one. And, and they're causing a lot of stress and strain, not only in the community, uh, but certainly with our grocery stores, our convenience stores. Um, and that's a, that's a really difficult position for them to be in. I think there are a lot of humorous memes around there, especially about the toilet toilet paper mm-hmm. and why can we not find toilet paper uh, that has nothing to do with COVID. Um, keep in mind that shortages on the shelves are primarily due to uh, high demand or unexpected buying. It's not mm-hmm. a supply chain issue. It's just an overbuying issue. Um, it's, uh, so this applies to foodstuffs as well as other supplies. Um, people aren't suddenly eating tons or using more toilet paper than they normally would. Um, some items are in short supply particularly masks, hand sanitizers, those types of things, mm-hmm. because we're asking people to use the hand sanitizers. We're actually asking people not to buy masks. Please save those for our healthcare workers and patients who need the masks. Right. Um, but our understanding is that manufacturing for those things is being scaled up. Uh, but it, when it comes to groceries and supplies in general, uh, please buy what you need what you need to be prepared for in case you do find yourself when in isolation or quarantine for an extended period of time. But don't overbuy because when you're overbuying, it means your neighbors can't buy what they need. So, again, be community-minded about this. Um, support That's one way we can support each mm-hmm. other is by not hoarding those critical supplies. And you can support your stores as well because they're under a lot of stress and strain right now. And yeah. they are doing the best they can no, I'm in with a you. difficult time. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up at the end because I think – you know, we've all been in the stores. We've spent a lot of time. Our liaisons have been talking to the supermarket managers and staff. And, I mean, I think we're watching their level of stress change quite a bit throughout this. And just anything we can do to help those folks who are providing such an essential service to the community. And it can be as simple as just, like, keeping our energy level, you know, just trying to dial it down just a little bit when we're in there shopping, mm-hmm. extra kind and pleasant with the people who are working there uh, behind the counters. Yeah. Um You know, it's difficult to put into words, but just they're in a tough place and and are doing a great job. Um, Here's another question from Orcus. Uh, Information about how the virus spreads is confusing. I agree. I think you agree. It feels contradictory at times. It Mm -hmm. spreads by droplets, not by air. People without symptoms can have it. They still spread. Mm -hmm. Just kind of what's your latest sense of where we're at with all this? Well, as you said, Brennan, there's there's still a lot that we are learning about this virus. We have researchers all over the world who are learning more and more and exploring these questions every day. And we will have the answers to those questions, but maybe not in time for us uh, for for today or for next week Mm -hmm. to prevent some of those uh, avenues of spread. But we will learn that over time. Um, The research so far, though, does indicate that this virus is transmitted by droplets. So when someone coughs or sneezes, um, on a surface, touches their hand, they, their hand touches the surface, um, that is a mode of transmission. So it's not airborne, like just breathing the air in, uh, which is a way that viruses like the measles spread, uh, and they're much more infectious as a result. So that's the good news, is it's not airborne. It's a respiratory droplet. They're heavier 
than air, so they usually don't travel quite as far, so that it also is good news. Um, and it's just really important that we're practicing good hygiene around how we cough and sneeze. And I don't know about you, but I'm experiencing seasonal allergies, which is kind of a rough time to experience that. Mm -hmm. Sneezing a little bit more, coughing a little bit, which is normal for me this time of year. Um, and it's due to the pollen count. Um, but making sure that even though I'm not symptomatic with any of those COVID system, uh, symptoms, that I'm also covering my cough well. Because the, you, you pointed out earlier, uh, there are a number of people who do have COVID who are asymptomatic. They don't have sy um, symptoms. Right. Uh, so just, real, again, it's beating that same message around public health, being really good about washing your hands, covering your cough, and then staying home when you're sick. That's the, those are the things we can do. Um, I think the best uh, way to prevent the illness, obviously, is avoid being exposed to it. So holding back more. Uh, social distancing is something we've been talking a lot about. Right. So six feet is thought to be a safe distance between people. Some people are saying three feet. I'd say better safe than sorry. Let's aim for six. And, uh, you know, there's no harm in that. And it's likely there are many mild cases of this going around, which will never be tested due to some of the uh, supply issues. And, and maybe just no one has symptoms, so they're not going to be tested. Um, this appears to be particularly true with children and teens. Right. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we're, we're trying to social distance, but yet mm -hmm. most of us are still finding the need to get out for essential goods, to go to the pharmacy, to the supermarket, to get gas. So someone's asking, how do they keep safe when they do mm -hmm. that? What are mm -hmm. our thoughts on, on best practices? Sure. Great question. Again, you're going to be tired of hearing us say this. <laughs> Wash your hands. Um, keep track of what you're touched with your dirty hands while you're out. You're going to be handling money. You're going to be handling products and goods. Um, you're going to touch your phone. So keep track of what you've touched and then wash those surfaces. It right. might be your hands. It might be uh, using an alcohol sanitizer or, or alcohol solution on your phone to keep clean that up after you've been right. out in public. Um, our local stores and our businesses are also working really hard to keep their staff and also customers safe. So if you think you've been, if you are sick, ask a friend or a neighbor to go to the grocery store, run your errands uh, to make sure, and also make sure you're not infecting your friends. So don't, don't touch them when they're bringing the goods back to you. Uh, sure. Maybe they can leave something on the doorstep and wave from afar and that's okay we still right. get that social contact it's, we're not totally isolated um, we, we can be neighborly we can be friendly but we can do it safely um, retailers are, are rolling out I think some really innovative approaches to minimizing contact between their staff mm -hmm. and customers and making sure that people are as safe as possible when they're coming to their stores right. um, this could range from having different hours for different vulnerable populations I've seen a lot of that out there starting right. to happen um, putting limits on peak traffic during uh, peak times or having home delivery services. Um, we have a really wonderful business community on, on all of our islands, really creative problem solvers uh, and compassionate community members. And they're looking out for both their employees and their customers, and they're doing a lot of great work around this. And, and again, I think we should thank them. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, I'm not sure. I think, oh, okay, this was a good question um, that someone asked, which is, and, and really this expands beyond just uh, going to the doctor, which is the topic. But the question is, should I go to the doctor on the mainland for a routine visit? But mm -hmm. bigger question here is, should I go to the mainland? Yeah, it is, I a, mean, it is a good question that a lot of people are asking. The more we can limit all travel and movement, including to the mainland, the better. So that's really, really important right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, we ask that you stop and think about whether that mainland trip is essential. And if it is essential, um, we ask that you or recommend and ask that you stay in your car on the ferry if you can. Uh, avoid contact with others as much as possible. Uh, and many islanders are in the habit of doing a whole lot of shopping. They're doing their Costco runs or their, their bulk runs when they're on the mainland. I, I do that as well. Um, but think about whether that's actually necessary right, right, right now. Uh, you can that will be there for you again later on. Uh, and if you do go into those mass settings and you are traveling more, you're increasing your risk right. for uh, getting COVID. You know yeah. there are uh, confirmed cases in all of the counties around us. So you're walking into a county uh, or that that actually has some community spread going on. Right. So confirmed think hard about spread. that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, what I hear, what I heard in there, which I think is really important, is just that, is this necessary? Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, I think that's the question that a lot of this boils down to for almost everything we're doing and all these calculations, which are so complicated and, I mean, necessary is a subjective term, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, that's the question we have to ask for almost everything we're doing um, yeah. as we work on this cooperative effort. Um, the next category um, is all about economic impacts. And you and I have been really focused on the public health side for mm -hmm. weeks, months. It's been a long time. Um, the economic piece, obviously, is incredibly significant, um, more so every day. Yeah. Um, and we know that there are a lot of people out there in the community who are, who are suffering, who are scared, who are having major challenges uh, in their work environment and other places in relation to this. And so... I think we're going to take a crack at this. Um, we're going to do the best we can. I've been having lots of good conversations with people in the community about this, so I might end up taking uh, some of these, but feel free to chime in if, I'll keep if the you have health. input. <laughs> you can keep the <laughs> economic. I'm Fair not an enough. economist. <laughs> um, no, me either, um, but I've been sure, sure I've been talking a lot to a lot of people about this. So the first question, um, and this is something we could spend hours talking about, but is how can we help businesses in our county weather the storm? Um, I mean, I, we all know this, but this is a vital issue. Um, I won't say it's more important than the public health side, but it's certainly as important. Um, and it's going to be important for a lot longer. Uh, it's going to take us time to come back from this. So it's not something that the county or anyone else is looking to lose track of, right? Um, we're not going to pay attention to the public health side at the expense of the economic mm -hmm. side. Um, it's absolutely critical. Um, I've worked on a lot of disaster responses around the country. Um, this is not like any of them in many ways. It's much more challenging. Um, but there are similarities. And, and what I see on disasters over and over again is that it's an opportunity for empathy and goodness and energy and creativity and community spirit to really come together and, and energize something which we never would have thought possible before the event, and all of a sudden we're doing things that kind of leave us amazed. Um, so sort of along those lines, I mean, I know that the Chambers of Commerce and the Economic Development Council, um, the community foundations, um, lots of businesses, informal groups, the Visitors Bureau, um, government at different levels, they're all working on innovative pro approaches. And mm -hmm. I think it's we have to be careful that this need is now growing and it's growing very quickly and we're kind of at this point where it seems like there's not a lot happening probably from some perspectives um, but from what I'm hearing and, and seeing and talking to people there are all sorts of things going on and I know in the Orcas community there are lots of people doing incredible work and I talked to Victoria at the EDC earlier today and they've got all these great projects that they're working on putting together around employment and projects and nonprofits, and so I just think that that is all going to spin up. And, I mean, from the county's perspective, our job is very much how do we support that effort? What do they need? Yep. Technology, staff, you know, is it a funding issue? Mm -hmm. um, and then just the challenge is how do we coordinate it, right? And how do we make sure that we're, we're not standing in the way of anything, but we're trying to be efficient and kind of as, as mm -hmm. effective as we can be? Um, I have no doubt we've already started to see this with uh, the Small Business Administration have made some 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 help available. Um, we're going to see a lot of help from the state level and the federal level, uh, from the nonprofit sector and donations from people in the community. Um, and we just need to be really um, proactive and coordinated and aggressive in how we how we manage that help and how we make sure that we reach out and figure out who all the people are in the community who need that help. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, so this is something I'm very passionate about. I think it's kind of the core of of what's going to get the island back on its feet. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm heartened by all the, all the super amazing, talented people working on this. So I don't have a, I don't have a firm answer, um, but I think that we need to re remember that there is a lot of work being done, and, and there's room in that work for anybody and everybody who wants to get involved mm -hmm. in trying to help out the islands. Mm -hmm. I think that there are just some real opportunities for creative problem solving, too, around helping businesses. Um, you know, are you a gym member and your gym is closed, could you just renew for a year right now um, and just kind of pay it forward? Um, what about if you bought uh, 20 haircuts in advance? You know, um, gift certificates for people at Christmas time, why not buy them now? Um, mm -hmm. I d mm -hmm. I'm not saying these are all the right answers or there are not lots of other better answers, but I just think that that kind of creative uh, approach and generosity um, is really important. And not everybody is in a position to be generous. Yep. But for those of us who are and those of us who can do that, that's a great way to really help our community. And then that kind of frees people up to help the folks who aren't in a great position to be generous and might need help themselves. So it's a really complicated balance, but it's something that we're working on. It's ongoing. 
Um, we're a super strong community, obviously, and when we get through this, it's going to have been because of that very fact. So, you know, it's a unified and forceful effort. Um, I think there are more questions about um, the economic side. Um, Again, kind of getting into details that maybe there aren't exact answers for yet, but uh, how can we help residents who are out of work? I think this was all one question, but these are touching on critical topics. Uh, will Opalco offer relief? Uh, what about rent and other necessities? Is the county considering an eviction prohibition? Um, and I'm not the definitive source on answers for all of these. I talked to someone at Opalco, Suzanne, earlier today. Um, I know that Opalco board met today, and they're going to be putting out some guidance shortly. The governor's had some things to say about utilities. Um, you know, there's been uh, legislation passed at both the state and the federal level around evictions um, and protections for renters there. I think that we're going to see a lot more of that in the very near future. Um, I won't say there's good news in this, but the reality is that the whole country and really the whole world is facing this. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of the things that we're grappling with here, we're going to get some outside support on the legislative side and the financial side that's going to help move it along. And then obviously we just have to be really good at the local level of identifying local needs that maybe are unique to us. And that's where local government and others can really step in to try to make and things I'm, happen. And I'm glad you raised that, Brendan, because it's keeping a close eye and ear on what could be available um, more broadly and also specifically that might still be an unmet need for San Juan County. We've mm -hmm. got very strong um, public leaders who do have their eyes and ears wide open and are looking for ways to bring as much of that back to our county as possible so that right. we can recover as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And a shout out for, you know, there, there are a number of local philanthropic organizations and the community foundations are a great example who have already started doing work and opening funds. And so if someone is watching this and is, a, is in a position to help, um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really easy sort of starting point for, for thinking about dollars and how dollars are going to be collected and then sh allocated out to the county. Um, again, it's not really my area of expertise and I don't want to speak for anyone else, but um, that has started and that will only continue to grow in, in the months to come. Um, the next message um, question, uh, I think this came from Lopez. Is the local government monitoring compliance with the new rules and the guidelines? And I think we're talking here about all of the restrictions being placed on businesses and groups and schools and all that sort of thing. And maybe I'll take a crack at this and, and chime in. Sure. Um, our sense um, very much so far is that many, many people are complying just because they know it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think certainly when we talk about this, um, our sense is that that's what we want to be happening here. We don't want to devote a lot of precious resources to monitoring or enforcement. We just want people to understand we're all in this together. Let's do the right thing. Um, we're San Juan County. We're not a big government organization. We don't have a team of inspectors to send out uh, across the county. Um, but we are going to monitor, right? And we're going to keep an eye on things, and we certainly want to hear about egregious examples of people not doing the right thing. Um, but that's not to say we want to hear about every time someone sees three teenagers together walking down the street. Um, there's, a, there's a balance point with all of this, and these decisions are hard to make. Um, so the county doesn't have any active enforcement plans, but we certainly have the capability to do that if mm -hmm. we need to. Um, but we're really counting on just good intentions and common sense to lead the way, hopefully. Um, man, these questions are, are, are difficult, but this is a, another really good question. Um, I keep hearing that the island is being flooded with tourists from the mainland or people trying to get out of King County. What is the county's position on this? Um, and and I'm not going to speak for the county. I, I think the county council is going to have this on their discussion topic uh, shortly. I know there's been a lot of conversation with lots of folks about this. Um, traffic is down in general. I mean, we know this from the ferry service. Um, but there have been some accounts of people coming to the islands basically for vacation. And, and it sort of like feels a little bit like it's, it's normal operations. Um, and I think that what our recommendation is going to be is that we really want to discourage that kind of traffic at this particular point in time. Um, and we want to remind everybody, whether they're visiting or whether they're coming to a second home or whatever the situation is, that we have an extremely fragile, fragile medical system here. I mean, that is our main concern with this situation, not just here, but everywhere. But we're extremely thin mm -hmm. here. And so limiting the people on the island, not only are we worried about the spread of the illness, but just limiting the drain on our resources 
is really critical. Um, so if there are people who are coming here because they have a, a second home here, um, I probably don't imagine a scenario where we limit that. Um, but we would ask that those people come with the supplies they need and they come with a plan to quarantine in place for two weeks um, as soon as they get here. And I, I mean, I don't know, speak more to the public health side of that. Sure. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because we do, we do have a medical system again, by design here in the islands, uh, where it's not equipped to handle a high level of medical need. We have a critical access hospital, and we're beyond grateful to have that hospital here in our county. Uh, That only goes up to a certain threshold before, again, people get uh, airlifted or transported by ambulance right. off the island to the mainland. Um, so that, that you know, it's a concern if we have more people burdening that already fragile system, as you mentioned. Uh, and then we have concerns about would the mainland hospitals take a resident from San Juan County uh, right. versus a Seattle resi- resident accessing that hospital in Seattle. So we need to be really mindful of that, that this is a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place. There are a lot of people who are saying, well, I'm working remotely. My kids are out for six to eight weeks, so might as well go up to San Juan County and stay up there. It's a nice idea, um, but it can really strain our already, again, fragile systems. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, And I just want to highlight to folks that there are no plans, and I really can't imagine a scenario where there were plans to shut down the ferries or impact ferry service. Um, I think we we talked about this in our last community meeting, our community update, where the ferries are a lifeline for commercial goods, mm-hmm. for people who are doing essential work on the mainland, who are coming from the mainland to support us. We've got physicians and nurses mm-hmm. and all sorts of people moving back and forth. So um, there are no plans for the ferries to shut down, um, and I don't see that changing uh, as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> Question, uh, I think this is from Orcus. I understand schools are giving lunches to children. Can you tell me about this? You're a parent. Maybe I'll let you take a crack at this one. I am a parent uh, of two children who are are schooling from home, and uh, I I just cannot thank enough the uh, school administrations and uh, the teachers for pivoting relatively quickly to a remote-based learning model. Uh, With uh, with those school closures also means a lot of kids are not getting the breakfasts and lunches that they rely on. Um, during the school year. And the schools have done a fantastic job. It looks a little bit different with each school district, and that's great. They get to design design that based mm-hmm. on their staffing and what the student needs are. Um, so school districts are organizing programs in this fashion. In most cases, it's um, uh, either a, a pickup point for, for warm breakfasts and lunches. Uh, in some cases, it might be a delivery to certain spots, per, perhaps a, an established bus stop. Um, we think it's a really vital service that they're providing to their students. Um, it's, it's bringing staff back in uh, to do all that cooking, and so they're working really hard to do that safely and also right. make sure that students are not uh, facing even uh, graver consequences by being out of school for this long. It's, no. it's tough. It's a strain, um, and my hat is off to, to the schools for, for handling this as well as they have. They're doing yeah, a fantastic it's really another, job. I mean, and again, there's a lot of bad news out there, um, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of good news happening already and I think what the schools have done is just like an incredible example of Mm -hmm. flexibility right empathy just working together um, being nimble Mm -hmm. uh, being willing to try new things and you know it's flexible right I mean not just for the schools but for all of us we're we're coming up with ideas we're trying them if we need to adjust them we do Um, and yeah it just it's it's an amazing amount of work that's gone into it Um, I think that's all the questions we have. I, mm-hmm. Kudos to anyone who's made it through with us uh, this far. Um, we're going to keep trying to do these. Um, as the workload ramps up, it's getting harder and harder for us to kind of pull out of all the other things. But I think it's a really valuable tool for working with the community, and mm-hmm. so I hope we continue to do it. Um, it's nice just to take time to reflect and think, we're lucky to have you doing this. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. thank you. Um, great. We're all in it together. Um, thanks, Ellen. Thank you, Brian. Take care, everybody. Thank you.